Okay guys, uh, we're going to kick off a series of electrochemistry videos and in this first one I'm actually going to be reviewing material from Chem 120, specifically the topic of oxidation numbers and oxidation states. I'll talk a little bit about some general concepts in, in electrochemistry, uh, but we're going to save the bulk of this new material for uh, forthcoming videos. Well, in this, in this first section of the chapter, I'm just going to introduce a few definitions, uh, and then we're going to talk about oxidation numbers, and then we might look, uh, we might save these, these other topics here for later, later videos. Uh, electrochemistry involves the study of oxidation reduction reactions. These are also called redox reactions for short, and what you want to know is the main characteristic of a redox reaction involves the transfer of electrons from one species to another and I think we'll see we'll see a very quick example of that on the next slide or so. Uh, on this slide what I'm doing is I'm presenting some um, uh, terms that will be used in this chapter, uh, some of which you know, others you may not have thought about before. Um, we're all pretty much familiar with the idea of electric charge, right? Protons have positive charges, electrons have negative charges. Electric charge on the SI unit system is measured in units of coulombs. This is that capital C. Uh, protons and electrons have very small charges on the SI unit system, so something like 10 to the minus 19 coulombs is the charge on an electron or a proton. But if you have, say, a mole of electrons changing hands, um, that, would, that would lead to a significant amount of charge that you can measure um, macroscopically. Uh, a related idea, um, the concept of an electric field. An electric field is an object uh, that exerts a force on a charge, and so the electric field strength is measured in units of newtons. That's the unit of force per coulomb. Uh, and the, the concepts behind the electric field give rise to these uh, rules of electrostatic attraction and repulsion that we know about. Opposite charges are attracted to each other, and like charges repel one another. And so that concept is at work here in, in the electrochemistry chapter. Uh, a term that you might not be familiar with, although you, you've, you've probably seen it before, the idea of a voltage. Uh, so that refers to an electric potential. Uh, which mean, which is the ability of an electric field to do work on, on a charge, so, so the ability to move charge around. And it's measured in units of volts. Uh, a volt uh, is a joule per coulomb. And we will make use of this topic later as we discuss electrochemical cells. Uh, at the very end of the chapter, we're going to discuss electric current which refers to the rate of charge flow uh, through a circuit. Electric current is measured in units of amperes, uh, which are coulombs per second. And so this is going to come up at the end of the, of the chapter. Um, in this slide, what I'm doing is I'm presenting a very simple example of a redox reaction. Again, uh, the main feature involves a transfer of electrons from one species to another, and so this slide is meant to illustrate that. So we'll consider the reaction between iron metal and aqueous copper sulfate to produce aqueous iron 2 sulfate and copper metal. If you break this reaction up into its total ionic equation and cancel the spectator ion, the sulfate in this case, you're left with this net ionic equation which shows the main chemistry that's happening. You're going from neutral iron uh, and uh, copper ions to, to iron ions and neutral copper. And so we can, we can um, state that the main, the main chemistry involved in this reaction is a transfer of electrons from iron metal to copper to ions. Uh, and this is a redox process. Uh, we basically need to be able to keep track of electrons in chemical reactions. That's how we can tell whether or not we have a redox reaction occurring. And if charge is being transferred around, uh, the idea here is that these so-called oxidation numbers uh, will change. Uh, 
uh, for the uh, for the atoms uh, within the within the reaction. And so what the what the oxidation number represents is a it's either an actual charge on an ion, or it's a hypothetical hypothetical charge that's assigned to atoms within a neutral molecule. And we use these various rules here to assign the oxidation numbers. And so this is often the first step in an electrochemistry problem. So we have to be able to assign oxidation numbers to atoms within chemical reactions. So the rules are as follows. The oxidation number for atoms within an element are zero. Uh, the oxidation number uh, for atoms within a monoatomic ion, so just a, a, an atom that's charged, um, the oxidation number is the ion's charge itself. Uh, we use rules three and four here, uh, sometimes rules five, to, uh, to quickly assign the oxidation number to either oxygen, hydrogen, or a halogen. So oxygen usually has a minus two oxidation number, hydrogen usually has a plus one oxidation number, and halogens are typically minus one. So we typically assign those atoms, their oxidation numbers first, and then we use these other two rules to determine the oxidation numbers for the other atoms within the uh, compounds that we're looking at. And so one of those rules is that the sum of the oxidation numbers for a neutral molecule must add up to zero. Another rule, if you're dealing with a polyatomic ion, the sum of the oxidation numbers need to add up to the ion's charge. And so we're going to look at some examples of assigning oxidation numbers in the next couple slides. So these are the easy ones here. In A and B, we have elements, okay, sodium metal, diatomic fluorine. The rule is the oxidation number assigned to the sodium atoms is zero in elemental sodium, and the same thing is true for fluorine. The oxidation number of fluorine is zero in diatomic fluorine. For parts C, D, and E, we have monoatomic ions, and by definition, the oxidation number for a monatomic ion is the ion charge. So iron is in a plus three oxidation state here. Bromide is in a minus one oxidation state. And the magnesium ion is in a plus two oxidation state. In these examples, we are trying to determine the oxidation number for all of the atoms within the molecule. And we, we want to look towards our uh, anchor atoms. So in the case of uh, sulfur dioxide, we first start with oxygen and we assign it an oxidation number of minus two because that's typically what oxygen is. Then we use the fact that the oxidation numbers must add up to zero for a neutral compound. So the oxidation number of sulfur plus two times the oxidation number for oxygen must add up to zero. Since oxygen is minus two, that allows us to solve for the oxidation number of sulfur as being plus four. We can do the same thing for water here. Uh, two times the oxidation number for hydrogen plus the oxidation number for oxygen must add up to zero. Oxygen is minus two, and we can use that to deduce that the hydrogen atom must be plus one. Now there are a couple of exceptions to these uh, examples that I've, that I've given. So, so while oxygen usually has a minus two oxidation state, sometimes it does not. And when it does not is in the case of peroxides. So we have hydrogen peroxide here in part C. In this case, uh, we just simply need to know that in a peroxide, the oxygen has a minus one oxidation state. And so that allows us to figure out that the hydrogen oxidation number is plus one. Uh, so peroxides, in particular hydrogen peroxide, is the example uh, of an exception to the oxygen rule. Uh, an exception to the um, to the hydrogen rule is given to us here in this barium hydride. This is actually an ionic compound, so both the barium and the hydrogens are actually monoatomic ions in this ionic compound. The barium is a plus two cation, and the hydrogen the hydrogen atom is actually a hydride, a minus one oxidation state. Uh, and so, so those are the oxidation numbers in the barium hydride. So you want to watch out for peroxides, and you want to watch out for metal hydrides as being the exceptions to the rules for oxygen and hydrogen, respectively. Uh, here we have some more examples. Okay, so in ammonia, 
uh, the oxidation uh, number of nitrogen plus three times the number for hydrogen must add up to zero. Hydrogen is one of our sort of anchor atoms that we can assign typically a plus one oxidation state to, and that allows us to find the oxidation number for nitrogen, minus three in this case. Uh, for the ammonium ion, the sum of the ion charge, or the sum of the atom charges need to add up to the ion charge, plus one in this case. So hydrogen we assign to plus one, then we use this equation to solve for the uh, oxidation number of nitrogen, we get a minus three. Uh, for sulfate here, the oxidation numbers need to add up to minus two, so it'll be the oxidation number of sulfur plus four times the oxidation number of oxygen will equal minus two. Oxygen by default is typically assigned to minus two oxidation state, which allows us to find the oxidation state of sulfur, and it's gonna be plus six. For the case of the mercury one cation, you have two mercury atoms, and then the sum of their oxidation states needs to add up to the ion charge, plus two in this case. So you divide that by two, and that tells you that the mercury uh, atoms within the mercury one cation have a plus one oxidation state, which is why this is called the mercury one cation. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop this uh, video here, and we'll pick up with, with half reactions in the next one.